It would be great to have your Bibles or Bible apps open as we uh, explore the theme of rest. And we'll start with Genesis chapter 2. So we'll go through a few different passages this morning. There's an outline um, of the sermon on the back of the new sheet with translation points and space for notes if that's helpful for you. Let's begin with prayer. Almighty Father, as you have given us your word, give us now your spirit that we may understand and live the things which we hear. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we conclude our Being Human series as we've been asking the question, what does it mean to be human? We are created in God's image and set apart for his purposes Even though we're designed with extraordinary capacity, we're also inherently flawed because of sin. Our limitations invite us into dependence as we look to Jesus, who redeemed us through his death and resurrection. Nine weeks ago, we started by exploring this principle that we are created, broken and redeemed. And then we focused on different aspects of our humanity. We are physical, rational, emotional, communal and relational. Last week, Amy showed us that we are made and purposed for work. We find satisfaction and purpose in our work only in Jesus. Just as we are purposed for work, rest is an important part of who we are as human beings. For the musicians amongst us, you will know that written music is made up of notes and rests. Notes tell us what sounds to make, rests indicate silence. Now we naturally think notes are more important than rests. Notes give us melody and harmony, but rests are important too because they shape the notes into phrases, just as commas and full stops shape our speech. Notes give players opportunities to rest as they take a breath or relax their body. But rest means more than just doing nothing. They require an action from the player, as sound doesn't just automatically stop. So, for example, A bass player might have to dampen their string to stop the sound. This is an illustration that rest doesn't always mean doing nothing, just as doing nothing isn't always restful. This relationship between notes and rests point us to the connection between work and rest. And our culture does tend to prioritise work over rest, even if we know intuitively how important rest is to us. This morning, we'll explore that rest is God's gift to us. Sin has distorted rest so that we resist it, and we can only find true and lasting rest in Jesus. You might have noticed over the last nine weeks that we often begin in Genesis 1, 2, or 3. And again, we find the origins of rest here. A couple of weeks ago, Rhys helpfully shared that through Genesis 1, we see God separating things, darkness and light, day and night, land and sea, male and female. The final separation is work and rest. Last week, we heard how God instituted work in Genesis 1 and 2. God instructs humanity to fill the earth, subdue it and rule over it. Then he places humanity in the garden to work and take care of it. In Genesis 2, God rests. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. 
Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. We see through the blessing of the seventh day a rhythm of work and rest. Whether that rhythm involves six days work or five or now maybe even four, what is important is a regular rhythm. We see that when that rhythm is skewed, and we see that in shift work or in fly-in, fly-out work, this can have a negative impact on both physical and mental health. But there are clues that rest is more than just the opposite of work. We rest because we get tired and worn out. God rested because his work was complete. The heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. We might get excited when our email inbox has been cleared or our physical inbox tray has been emptied, but it doesn't stay that way for long. So when we get the opportunity to rest, we're often drawn out into God's creation where we can marvel at the beauty of creation and worship God the Creator. We also see that there is no definite end to the seventh day. Days one to six finish with the similar refrain. There was evening and there was morning the first day, second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth. Day seven has no such ending. This suggests that God's rest for his people isn't confined to just one day. We are pointed forward to an eternal rest that is yet to come. We next see rest mentioned at Mount Sinai. The Israelites have been rescued by God from slavery in Egypt and brought to the mountain through the Red Sea to worship God, their Redeemer. On the mountain, Moses receives the Ten Commandments, which include the command to rest. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work. The commandment references the creation account we've just heard, but this command is given in a new context, the context of redemption and covenant. Rest is now not just about recognising God as creator, but as redeemer and saviour. It's an important way of, for the Israelites to remember their need for salvation and remaining faithful to God who saved them. Rest is a common theme also throughout the Psalms. In Psalm 23... We hear the good shepherd makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside quiet waters and he refreshes our souls. In him we lack nothing, for God is our provider. And ultimately he provides a saviour for us in his son. We rest because God is our provider and we can trust that God will provide all that we need. Again, in Psalm 62, David says this about rest. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. David's position and security have come under threat. He feels fragile, like a leaning wall or a tottering fence ready to topple at any moment. His enemies speak well of him to his face, but curse him in their hearts and spread lies about him. This situation causes David to really reevaluate where he puts his trust. He declares most of the things that people look to for security, like social position or riches, are not able to actually provide it. Despite 
the danger faced by David, he can rest. He can rest in the protection of God because he is just and the only source of true power. So we see through scripture how God has gifted us rest. And we find rest in God because he is creator, redeemer, provider and protector. As we've heard over and over during the series, sin has distorted God's plan for humanity in all areas of our lives. And so it should be no surprise that sin has caused us to resist God's intention for rest. Now, in the first century, there was a very different issue with rest. The Pharisees saw adherence to the law as the pathway to righteousness. And so in terms of rest or Sabbath, a whole series of rules were drawn up to make sure people didn't inadvertently break the Sabbath and become separated from God. But instead of helping people to rest and pointing them to God, these rules just added another burden to people as they were constantly worried about breaking the law. And so God's good intention for rest was lost. But today, the opposite is true. There is absolute resistance to the concept of God's rhythm of work and rest. Our culture prioritises productivity and constant activity over rest. Taking time for rest can be seen as laziness or unproductive. We're encouraged to seize the day, to make the most of absolutely every opportunity. There's no time for rest. For workaholics, identity and self-worth comes from work and make it difficult to embrace rest as they fear it may diminish their value or purpose. High achievers and those with ambitious goals resist rest because they believe success demands constant effort and sacrifice. Modern technology has blurred the boundaries between work and personal life. This constant connectivity can make it challenging for us to disconnect and rest as we feel the pressure to be available at all times. Especially in these times, financial pressures and the rising cost of living can push us to work tirelessly. Financial concerns can override the desire and need for rest and the fear of missing out on opportunities or experiences can lead us to resist rest. We worry that by taking time off, we might miss a chance to advance in our careers or relationships. So these are the social, personal, cultural factors which lead us to resist rest, but there are our important spiritual factors as well. We find in Exodus 16, the Israelites... Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, that is, manna, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day. Now, this passage comes after God's dramatic rescue of the Israelites from Egypt. Through awesome displays of power and might, God demonstrated his faithfulness to Israel and delivered them from the bondage of slavery. As they journey towards the promised land, God continues to provide all their needs, including food in the form of manna. He instructs them to collect enough manna for each day, with the exception of the sixth day, where they are commanded to collect enough for two days, so they can rest on the Sabbath. You would imagine that after experiencing this dramatic and miraculous exodus from Egypt, there should be no reason for the Israelites to believe that God wouldn't provide for their needs. But there are still some in Israel who go out on the seventh day looking for manna. 
the deeper problem within the hearts of his people is they do not trust God's provision and so they cannot rest. So today, people who don't trust God will not be able to allow him to restore their relationship with him and with other people that's broken through sin. The result being they cannot rest as they continue to rely on their own strength and their goodness and their work. So distrust is one reason why people resist rest and dissatisfaction is another. We look at Ecclesiastes where the author observes that some people work constantly because neither their work nor the fruits of their labour nor pleasure brings them any satisfaction. In chapter 4 of Ecclesiastes, I saw vanity under the sun, the case of solitary individuals without sons or brothers, yet there is no end to all their toil and their eyes are never satisfied with riches. For whom am I toiling, they ask, and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. People end up in this unhappy business of working to relieve dissatisfaction with their lives, their loss of relationship with God and with others, their fears about not having enough and their inability to find pleasure in anything. But this obsessive work or striving only makes people more restless and unhappy. Exhausted, but yearning for more. Rest is God's gift to us. Sin has distorted rest, but Jesus restores rest if we are humble and look to him. We turn now to Matthew chapter 12. And we find that Jesus and his disciples do break the rules of Sabbath by picking grains on the Sabbath day, an action that actually would have been legal on any other day. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. Then Jesus breaks the law again by healing on the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. Jesus responds to the accusations of the Pharisees by opening their minds to the true meaning of Sabbath and rest. First, he reminds them that human need is more important than observing ceremonial rituals or rules. Even David and his men broke the law by eating the consecrated bread. Jesus' disciples were hungry. They were not merely wanting a snack. The man in the synagogue had a significant disability, so healing him would have transformed his life. Not meeting human need is a way of restricting access to God's rest. Second, he reminds the Pharisees that God prefers mercy over sacrifice. The Pharisees' approach to the law meant that people were burdened by these expectations instead of being pointed to the mercy and kindness of God. Jesus challenges them with this illustration. If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? In other words, wouldn't you do work on the Sabbath? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he backs up his teaching about the Sabbath with these extraordinary claims. Yet I say to you that in this place, there is one greater than the temple. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The temple was God's dwelling place amongst Israel, the place where people would encounter God. Jesus says he is greater than the temple because he is God 
and people encounter God in and through him. That means he is Lord of everything, including over the Sabbath. In the creation account, Sabbath shows that history is going somewhere. It is a sign that creation is headed towards a final rest. In this moment, we see that Jesus thought the entire Sabbath principle pointed towards him. And so we find rest fully and only in him. Here are some ways we can find rest in the arms of Jesus. We can find rest when we call out to Jesus in prayer as we hand over our concerns and worries to him. This follows Jesus' example, who often withdrew from the crowds to pray to the Father. Jesus promises to share our burdens as he walks with us. From Psalm 4, Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. We rest because God hears and answers our prayers. He has mercy on us. We find rest when we trust Jesus with our future. When we trust in Jesus as our saviour and ultimate provider, we are released from the burden of being the master of our own destiny, the burden of being self-sufficient. As Psalm 16 teaches us, with him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. We can rest because we are assured of our future in him. We find rest when we allow Jesus to lead us. Jesus taught that he is the way, the truth and the life. Psalm 23 tells us he guides us along the right paths for his name's sake. In Jesus, we find the path to contentment so that we're not continually searching for satisfaction in our work, our possessions or our achievements. As Paul wrote, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty or hunger, abundance and need. And so I can do all things through him who strengthens me. How is your work rest balance going? It's a challenging question for all of us. Of course we need a work rest balance that works for us, for our family. But there is more to rest than not being at work. Do you trust that God is your creator, your redeemer, your provider, and your protector? Or do you find yourself working harder and harder to fill that gap Jesus yearns to fill? If you're not sure who Jesus is, or what he has done, if you're not confident that Jesus is the true source of rest, then I invite you to take a next step and consider coming to our next Alpha course, which is starting soon. It's an opportunity to explore the great questions of meaning, of life, and of faith. Do you find contentment in your identity as a child of God? Or do you find yourself striving for what the world tells us is important but never feeling satisfied? Remember this invitation from Jesus. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. As we draw near to Christ, 
we will find rest in him and confidently say, Christ is enough for me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you demonstrate to us the rhythm of work and rest and that you, we find rest ultimately in your Son, Jesus. Help us to take rest from work, trusting that you will provide for us. Help us in our times of rest to reflect on your great faithfulness. In rest, help us to remember our greatest need is connection and relationship with you. Help us to stop all the striving that promises to make us feel valuable and worthy, trusting that in Jesus, you have given us our true value and worth. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.